low and why this might be higher? Well, I, I would clarify that this has always been low. It, it, it has generally been low. But I'll come back to one particular election when it definitely was not low. But the level of interest in local government has generally been lower than for the parliamentary elections. And one of the reasons is really that there is greatest coming from what happens at Gordon House as far as the population is concerned. And, the, and it's local government generally has been treated perhaps bastard child of the system of governance in Jamaica. The, the people generally treat it that way as well. I think the profile of local government has risen uh, more in recent times and I think there is probably greater visibility local representatives. I think the, the recent poll, one of the questions suggested that there are more people who at least, who at least recognize and know who they represent. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, that's a low bar, but I mean, believe it or not, believe it or not, there have traditionally been some councillors that hardly anybody in, in their division know right. them. So the shift, I believe, where that is concerned. But in respect of this, this particular election, right. consider the fact that the last local government election was 2016, November, I think it was. Right. And then we had the parliamentary election in 2020, which was affected significantly by the COVID-19 pandemic. So the was dismal as well, 30 mm -hmm. something percent turnout. So you're thinking that persons really there want is, to go out and vote, but they were hampered spent, by before. Yes, yes people, were hampered in, people were hampered in 2016. 2020. There are not many people who really wanted to venture of that time. Mm -hmm. When I think if you mm -hmm. when I think if you if you recall, we did not give a vaccine for okay. COVID nineteen. So there was fear there, and that's there why was that a great was deal of fear. and that's why the anticipation is now so high for this one. Before you continue, Earl, uh, of, as I said earlier, the polls opened at seven this morning. Now, opposition leader Mark Going he cast his ballot at about seven thirty at Three Disbury Avenue, and that's Kingston six. Mr. Golding was scheduled to do so at 7 a.m., so I guess he was running a little bit late. But there was some delay there, so let's hear from them. Looking forward to a good result. Yeah, man. You know, we work hard. We've had a very effective and positive campaign. Our manifesto has a new vision for local government, which we look forward to executing. And I look forward to, after this day, what, has, what, what will come next. There's been no violence that I'm aware of. There have been a, some unfortunate instances we all know about on motorcade. Violence, no. I'm hoping that today will be a continuation of that, for our democracy to maintain a high standard. We know all the tactics that the other side have been using. We've seen videos. Uh, you know, I'm not going to get into those details, but our comrades are standing firm and the people of Jamaica are standing firm with us. Okay, that's uh, opposition leader Mark Golden there when he voted this morning. Now, we have our reporters right across the island in several parishes and at several polling stations just taking a, a gauge of what's happening and monitoring everything to bring to you as it happens. We have Sandy Williams. We're now, she now joins us in Clarendon. Thanks, Herman. I'm at the Mocker Primary and Infant School in the Mocker Division, North Central Clarendon. Now, voting started at 7 this morning, and since then, the process has been smooth. There has been ports of issues or delays. Now, there's not much festivity on the ground, but have, I've been noticing um, carloads of supporters from both the Jamaica Labour Party and the People's National Party coming in with people from various communities to cast their Board. Now, earlier I went to the Brixton Hill Primary and Infant School. Now, persons came to that facility as early as 5 a.m. this morning. Uh, supporters say they wanted to be among the first group of people to cast their ballot. Now, remember, the Mocker division is being contested by the PMP's Romaine Morris and the JLP's Clement Alves. Now, I spoke to one PMP supporter, Mr. Gareth Hansen, who says he's been voting for the People's National Party for more than 20 years. And with Mr. Morris recently joining the People's National Party, he's equally supportive of Mr. Morris. Uh, Romaine, coming across is a very hard work. He's a very, very hard on the Labour side. We're really pondering if we should, should vote against him, even if he was voting for the Labour rights. 
But now that you come over, it makes the job more easier for us. Because he's one of the most hard-working cones that ever come to Moko. So it's hard to stop the, pro the progress from going on now. I also noticed uh, one person with a disability at the polling station this morning. Now, remember, the Disabilities Act, which came into effect in 2022, protects the right of people living with disabilities. And one of those rights is accessibility. Now, that piece of legislation states that public buildings as well as private buildings buildings providing public services must be accessible easily accessible and usable by people living with disabilities now under the brixton hill primary school which is a two-story building in the past had its polling center on the second its polling center on the second floor and now with the disabilities out is on the ground floor and so i spoke with sir barnett christian to find out what experience like this morning he told, told me that in the last local government election while he was able to uh cut this time around his experience was different were there any, are there any challenges getting access to the position no uh, easily easy i just when, when i went the lady okay, somebody else and the lady said after i must come in and cast my my vote and uh yeah, yeah. In the last local government elections, that's 2016 and 2012, the Jamaica Labour Party won the division by more than more than 50 percent of the votes. No, no. In 2016, uh, the JP, who is who was being represented in Morris, got 1,214 votes, while the PMP's Lawrence Weathers got only 822 votes. Now, Mr. Morris, who recently crossed the floor to join the People's National Party, is hoping to attract more than 50 percent of the votes a second time. Now, I will be keep I will be monitoring other polling stations in the division and i will also be visiting other divisions to note the mineral heights division which has the largest voting population across clarendon as you may recall in previous reports the mineral heights division has been without a sitting council for three years following the passing of the jlp's milton brown who was the sitting councillor prior to that the mineral heights division has always been a jlp stronghold since the division was created in the late 1990s and so i will be visiting polling stations in that division and provide you with an update in subsequent newscasts covering the grounds in clarendon i'm sandy williams and it's back to you in studio all right thank you very much sandy well done over there in clarendon now uh before we go to our other reporters uh as i said earlier we do have a former mayor of portmore keith Hines, here with us mr Hines, i also want to bring you in here you you were on the ground back then you were mayor between 2007 and 2012 mm -hmm. right and you've seen how the the voter turnout then and how persons have dealt with local government elections from then compare that to what you're seeing now what kind of difference do you see and what do you think is causing that well, one of the things in 2007 to 2012, the visibility of the candidate would have been one of the important factors then. And because at that time, as a male, well, as a male candidate, I was involved in everything. I, 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 I kept abreast of all the situations that were happening and dealt with all the, the things that I saw was important to the people. Now, now I find that a lot of our candidates seem to think that they are entitled. And by that, they say, well, in some places, well, I'm a comrade or I'm a laborite. And, and because of that scenario, people think that, oh, I'm entitled to win. No. No, we have a different generation. And the generation now is anticipating from its leadership certain things that they need to see. And until they see that... So, so you think back then... Uh, I said it like it was a long time ago, but in 2007 mm. coming up, you're saying that the candidates were more visible? Visible, yes. And so, well, I, uh, for me, certainly, I know I was a very visible candidate. Mm -hmm. right? And um, one of the things that I, I find, though, as I said, the entitlement of some persons is just unbelievable. Well, the, the argument now is that the candidates are 
because of the built-up tension in terms of voting, candidates yeah. are leaning on the MP and the party leaders heavily in terms of getting a vote to win. Well, so you're saying that is part of it in terms that of is, That is part of it because what, what would turn out, and I think we're going to see possibly close to 50% turnout today because, of course, you know, the opposition leader has ramped the thing up to a national election status and, uh, you know, the governing Labour Party had to literally went, go into that mode. And so people are really charged up for this election, right? I just sincerely hope that whoever wins tonight, and I'm hoping that the Labour Party wins, that they will understand that we are going into a different mode. Our young people are expecting more from us than what obtained them. Okay. Uh. All right, Mr. Robert, I want to bring you in quickly here. Uh, from the Chamber of Commerce standpoint, uh, how do you see the local government in terms of how biz the business community actually benefits from councillors and the responsibility and the jobs that they do? Well, technically, the councillors are supposed to drive, local government supposed to drive and drive the initial concept of putting the business, business community, providing the, the leadership putting the, the various acumens to enhance the business. Right. But what is happening lately and, and for, 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 for over and over, subsequent administrations seem to have fallen down, in my estimation, in not driving commerce in that regard and, and, and other areas that, 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 that business could be maintained and brought to another level. Um, let us look at St. Catherine, which, which I am passionate about. You, you know that, Earl. It's something I, I, I live for Spanish town and I'm passionate about it. And, and, and I think all towns in most areas suffer the same problem that we have. <coughs> Successive governments neglect parishes and towns, townships like Spanish town. Look at Spanish town. We have so much going for it. What have administrations previous and otherwise done. Look at the, the square, for example. This is a heritage mm -hmm. right. that we were given, something that can generate the economic upgrade to a level that we could be self-sufficient. Well, I'm happy you bring that up because over the years, and even now we're still seeing where once you mention local government, mm -hmm. persons tend to go to gravitate to the usual thing, road, Water. Well, I mean, basically, it doesn't go beyond that over the past couple of decades. Mm -hmm. So, for the business community, what more do you really want to see these councillors doing? Well, put it this way: infrastructure is something that <coughs> enhances any township, any community, any parish. Mm -hmm. And look, our our infrastructure is dated some probably two hundred years. Uh, on that point, um, yes, sir. I just want to, to make the the point that Spanish Town is close to being unique among towns and mm. the cities in Jamaica, given its history. Yeah. You're talking about the most well-established uh, city in Jamaica under Spanish mm. occupation and governance, yeah. which then carried over into British colonial authority. And the British colonial government was headquartered there until the late um, 19th century. Mm -hmm. And so you have that aging infrastructure but an infrastructure that has the potential, even in the 21st century, to be renovated, mm -hmm. redeveloped, and some of it uh, can form the basis and the catalyst for significant economic development course, based on heritage course. tourism, etc. Just, yeah. so, mm -hmm. just, no, just to make a point in that regard, when I became mayor, I realized instantly, like, Portmore was an emerging city. And if you look, I spent three and a half hours in former Minister Ali Shah's office, and I wouldn't leave until he gave me a yes. And that is why Portmore now has a tax office. Um, there are some things in there. Look at the beach in Portmore now. Elsha Beach, for argument's sake. Lime at the time now flow. I engage them, and we put the, the thing around the front of the beach with the intention to fix the reef. The mere responsibility is really a developmental role not just to say well i'm a party supporter or this um i can i can go on and on about the situation that the nagazet bus park mm -hmm. in nagazet which one time was just a hot crime spot now the council is able to collect from that spot all the lands that were given to the portmore municipal council came from me 
Okay. In, in, you said something when you started that you yeah. spent hours in the MP's office. Yes. Yeah. But that brings Minister. us back to that brings us back to a question that has, yeah. has has surfaced now in terms of shouldn't the local government representatives be able to stand on their own? Meaning local government minister no. deals with local with councils with, well, with if you municipal corporations no. and not being under the uh, the MP no. basically. Well, put it this way: you have to understand the hierarchy, the, the tiers of government, mm -hmm. and if you want to get stuff done as a mayor or as a councillor you have to get to the area that has the signature to sign off on these things. Mm -hmm. Like the new development going up on Elsha Road now. I had gone to Minister Oris Chang and said, listen, Minister, I need a Long Mountain type of thing in Portmore. And it's now being done. As we speak, that development is going on, right? When he so, was housing minister. Yeah, yeah, he was housing minister at the time. Mm. As I said, Audley Shaw gave that tax office to Portmore. And the first five days, him scream out, yeah, there's so much money there at Portmore. I can't <laughs> say it on Portmore because I don't want people to start blocking Portmore people out. But I mean, Portmore tax office has become one of the most important ones. Mm. We got all the lands in Portmore for the municipality. And the intention was we got 16 acres and on it, the council building should be there. Around it, fire station, tax office, RGD, all of those things should have been there. Now, what has been done with the land is that they take the 16 acre and put up this big white building on it and call it the White House. Mm -hmm. The citizens have to go and stand in line at the tax office. Mm -hmm. Still, because they did not understand, even an amphitheater should have been there. They don't understand the mindset. We're looking at now, I see the Prime Minister now, putting up a park in the center of Portmore. Mm -hmm. That was my idea, and the mm -hmm. idea was to put a park and a transport center to take the traffic out of the mall right. and put it in the middle there. And I'm happy that the Prime Minister is doing this, mm -hmm. right? But if you have mayors, and by the way, I want to say this on this program, every cohort of elected officials that win this election, the government of Jamaica, whether PMP or GLP, should send them to mind for six months. Because you can't get a man who drink plenty of rum, $500 million to manage, and don't at least teach him how to manage it. So maybe you should teach them before they run for the position then, well, instead of no, afterwards. No, we're not, but but we're I want to move on. Earl, the, the thing, I want to come back to, the, to the, uh, the same thing that he said again. Because we have always been saying that the... MP seems to run the constituency and the divisions because the councillors basically have to go to the MP. I'm asking this because isn't the system structured in such a way that the local government minister, as the member from central government, should be the one who the councillors and the mayors basically lays with in terms of getting things done? Why do they, should it be that they have to go to the minister of water, the minister of housing or whatever to get things done? No, but I, I would say though that there is, there, there is reasonable ground on which a mayor who is very active and proactive for him to go to the respective portfolio minister if he is perceiving. So, for example, as mayor of Portmore, I don't think it made sense for Mr. Hines to have to go through the Minister of Local Government to get through to the Minister of Finance in respect mm -hmm. of that revenue office that he wanted to have established there. So there's good reason for sometimes for the minister, for the particular mayor to have direct access to whichever cabinet minister mm -hmm. is responsible for the particular areas that he's wishing to pursue because there are some things that are local government specific which he would liaise with his local government minister uh, about. Okay. But it makes it, I think it is more pragmatic to okay. go directly to a portfolio minister for other, for other areas of, of development that he is pursuing. By the way, uh, one of the, and, and I mean, Mr. Hines can speak about the extent to which that it has helped or not helped, but there was the matter of the establishment of the parochial revenue fund mm -hmm. uh, somewhere uh, approaching 2007 or somewhere in that, in, some, in the early 2000s, right. which I think, uh, at least in principle, should have provided the municipalities and the councillors and mayors a certain level of autonomy from central government. Uh, as far as to what extent it has ameliorated the traditional reliance on central government, maybe he can speak more than I can. Well, you know, well one, one thing I'd like to say quickly here is that consider a place like the Forum Hotel mm -hmm. that was sitting there in Portmore for well over 20 years. Uh -huh. And this mayor 
got involved and decided that I went and looked at the building. I walked it up and down as a person who was involved in construction. And when I saw this thing, I said, but nothing wrong with this building. But to get what happened next to happen, I had to go to the most honorable Bruce Golding because he was the prime minister at the time that would have been the responsibility. Mm -hmm. And he sent, he asked Miss Joy Douglas to go and look and see what nonsense the mayor was talking about. To date, Forum building is now one of the nicest little things in Portmore. It did not go in the way that I would have wished it to go. Because I wanted your, it to but go. But your intervention pushed it yeah, to Yeah, no, I to. definitely I want, so. to, I want to hold that thought. Yeah. You're in St. Kath you're at Portmore, St. Catherine. You're the former mayor there. Mm -hmm. And uh, our reporter, Raquel Porter, she's in St. Catherine. And we now join her live for the latest in that parish. Raquel, what can you tell us? Raquel, are you hearing me? Oh, we seem to be having some... Raquel, are you hearing me? Oh, we'll have to get back to Raquel in a minute. She is covering uh, activities in St. Well, Catherine. Yeah. Well, while you're waiting, perhaps to get back to, to Raquel, let me go back to the numbers that we were talking about at the beginning in terms of voter turnout for elections. Uh, 1986 was mm -hmm. one of those, I suppose the Americans would call it an outlier, mm -hmm. in that... The voter turnout for that election, a local government election, was 65.5%, right. which is huge by today's parliamentary election standards. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the reason for that, the context is that the PNP had boycotted the 1983 election. The last, the last local government election was 1981. The last parliamentary election was 1980. So there was a lot of pent-up energy and emotions uh, during the intervening year, the years. And of course, Michael Manley seeking a return, a resurgence, put all of his energy into that particular election. The, the, the incumbent government was going through a period of austerity. And so it, the, the recipe was right was, um, for that kind of energetic election. And that is why you had that kind of turnout in 1986. I'm not saying that this particular election will come anywhere near 65.5%. But it certainly should be significantly above thirty yeah. percent, which yes, is what yes. we had. Because last of that time. same built up, that mm -hmm. uh, there is some tension sort of for uh, yes. political tension, so to speak. Mm -hmm. uh, we were speaking about Saint Catherine before we we tried to contact uh, Raquel there. I hope we'll get through to her in a minute. But um, Mr. Uh, Mr. Robotham, yes, sir. I, I really want to come back now. We, we've heard out how the mayor lays with the government officials in ter in different capacities to get things done. Does that work for the business community in terms of getting what you want to see done in your parish done? I would say no, you know. I, mm. I, 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 we are not seeing that sort of synergy that creates the, 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 the sector to move to the other level. Mm. And as you know, and Earl probably can back me up on, uh, Mr. Hines as well, that Spanish town is possibly the fastest growing township in Jamaica right now. And um, I don't know if you understand what is happening, but, you know, Grace Kennedy, Carrie Maid and all, the, and, and the Dumbbell Holding Stretch is a new, a new um, development of commercial activities. Mm -hmm. And where you, I don't know if you remember where um, the free zone was slated mm -hmm. to have been, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. is now a major commercial complex. Very expensive. Mm -hmm. Because I, I understand courts is there, NCB, the developers that did Sajikor um, in on Brunswick Avenue Brunswick, yes. is doing that that stretch there, thirty acres, and I, from my understanding, is a one point five million per acre or acre and a half. So, so the business US, community is US, right? So the right. US, so the business community is actually spreading and getting their things done. Right. Are you saying that that is without any assistance from the? Yes, definitely. And the infrastructure, again, is not even going in tandem with, with, with what is moving. And if you go into the town itself, we have our own locals, and let us remember that the Chinese are now taking over Spanish town in droves. Mm -hmm. They are buying the properties, and putting up buildings. So, so the assistance that you would want to see from local government in this regard, how, what would that look like? To infrastructure, roads, water proper garbage collection. The whole system needs to be overhauled. Mm -hmm. 
mm. and revamped because many of the roads are, as I say, gutters are still, you know, there and the garbage that is in it and that sort of thing is necessary for us to move to another level. And if it continues, I mean, when rain falls, there's no way to walk. The road is flooded. Flooded. Don't forget the social yeah. side, though, in, including the crime problem, the extortion, yeah, all well, of that. Well, we, we're going down there, you know. <coughs> Excuse me. But based on the question mm. that was posed, mm. I am just saying I that. I see one of the parties are, are, are saying in, the, in, in this manifesto that dealing with the crime problem at the local level is one of its priorities, including mm. expenditure at the local level on infrastructure for Jamaica I, in addition mm. to the sure, national sure. infrastructure. Mm -hmm. I don't know whether the funds are there, but your response is something like that. Yeah, 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 but there's something that we would like to see. But we have had green papers and a lot of papers. We have Sparkum that was mm. introduced in the 80s or 90s, um, round about when Bruce was there. Nothing has come to fruition mm -hmm. where that is concerned, and Spanish Town is left to, to decay. Yeah. The buildings are, I mean, mm -hmm. uh, back to the, the tourism aspect of it, it's the only perfect Georgian square in the Western Hemisphere. The mm -hmm. Iron Bridge is the only one in the Western Hemisphere. Yes. I, I want Heinz to res respond to that uh, in a minute. But, uh, of course, you're watching our coverage of the Vote 24, the local government election. Uh, we, Heinz, of course, is a former mayor of Portmore. We had asked the former uh, Noel Arska, the former local government minister, to be here. But he is running uh, terribly late. He voted uh, outside of Kingston, and so he's not with us just yet. So, Mr. Hines, you've heard what he, have, he has outlined. Your response to that? Well, as again, you know, I said it was dependent on your elected representatives who you elect into office, right? Like, while I was mayor, I offered up a suggestion of what I call a, a joined-up um, approach to tourism, what I call the Southeastern Tourism Block. Mapin, Spanish Town, Portmore, Port Royal, Kingston, right? And in that, you would find all the amenities that could easily supply our um, tourism product from Port Royal into various areas at short period of time. Now, I noticed at one stage, if I go back and look at the time, and I know Minister uh, Mackenzie had mentioned it in one of his things. He didn't have a discussion with me personally. But I would say that Spanish Town has a particular, and when I say Spanish Town, we're talking about the town. And if you're going to really develop the town, it would really mean bringing the town into just a tourism perspective, because anything else, based on how the buildings are set there, is to knock down the town and rebuild it. And I'm sure my good friend would want to see that. Oh, right? because the history is there. Right, the history is there. So you can, in fact, create, in fact, a tourism hub inside there. But, but me, if I might just interject, sure. because you always remember that, that the town itself, the old Spanish mm. town, was moved to some extent into where LOG had put up the, the new plaza yeah. and that, than the bus terminus. Right. So you, you don't have that kind of congestion into, in that, that in, into the main square. So mm. it, it can coexist. And if I had my way as main, the, the development you're talking about and Dumbly Wooden Road would not be called Spanish Town, you know. It should be rightly Portmore. <laughs> <laughs> it's right away you want to capture some of the glory, but the fact of the matter is that there is that what it is, what it is. Yeah. You know, I, I, I'm going to get rid of this St. Catherine focus in this discussion. <laughs> what, about, what about the historic town of Black River? But I, I take St. Catherine issues because it's interesting that some of these issues actually spread to the other uh, areas. Uh, yes. uh, as I said earlier, we did invite Mr. R. Scott, Noel R. Scott, the former local government minister to speak. And I think he's from Clarendon. Yes. So we would have, would have hoped that he would have brought some um, well, perspective. My, my, insight to that, my wife, things in that aspect. My wife is here, you know, and she can give you the Black River <laughs> perspective because she's from St. Elizabeth. And in truth and in fact, I, I not even, a lot of persons don't even understand that. Black River, the first place that had electricity, first place that had motor car. These things, you know, who should be pushing that narrative? The mayor? But let me just come in here a bit because we, we, we're focusing on Spanish now. Mm. I focus on St. Catherine. Mm -hmm. And St. Catherine have history in Old Harbour, in Sligoville, mm. 
Colbeck, Castle in, in, in Old Harbor. Who incidentally, this meal yeah. brought water to the Colbeck Castle when I was sitting on the NIC board. Um, if I, I put it to both of you, sure. that if all the municipalities, all the mayors, if they were to collaborate with the tourism interests across the country, Fantastic. you could have guided tours throughout all of the historic centers of these old towns, in particularly every, the in, every parish, basically. in every, every parish, parish. Mm -hmm. because there is so much history. A, a friend of mine does, does, does a walking tour of Black River, and if you, if you go on that tour with her, it is fascinating what people discover in one hour's walk around that town, mm -hmm. the depth of the history of that town, and the same can apply to just about any Every other. Town, which is what I'm, uh, I'm thinking. Um, I'm coming back to what Mr. Robert said earlier America. about Spanish town, mm. and that's because he's, of course, representing yeah. uh, the business sector in that parish. Spanish town is, has its history, but it doesn't look like it's being maintained mm. or, or kept totally. to, to um, it is attract to visitors. And that can be said about all of these historical sites across the island. Mm. I mean, Port Royal, as much as we praise it and we know what its mm. worth is. Sometimes you go over there, the, everything looks like mm -hmm. derelicts and yeah, this, yeah, this yeah, yeah, not yeah, attractive I or like being sold in that way. How then does the local government, how would you like to see, Mr. Robotham, the local government, the mayors of each uh, city, each parish, basically rallying, whether it's the tourism uh, ministry, any aspect of, of local, of central government to actually develop and do these tours as early as Well, I can tell out. you, um, Spanish town, um, at the time, Council uh, Norman Scott did uh, actually start something. I was made chair of the Heritage Trail, and re re there was refurbishing of the museum through UDC. Mm -hmm. The sidewalks were repaved, and there was a big plan. And, and actually, we got NGOs to. Um, underwrite the cost of training 30 or 29 tour guides. An actual office was set up to deal with tours. And it is, I think it is there now and was manned by volunteers. Mm -hmm. Fact of the matter is, a lot of work went into it. And we got no traction mm -hmm. from central government. Mm -hmm. and, and that's what the issue is. But before mm -hmm. we continue that discussion, we are covering our uh, voting right across the parish, and um, our reporters are in every parish, basically. We're now joined by another of our reporters, Nakinski Robinson. She's in St. James. Nakinski, what's happening there? Thanks, Herman. I just got back to the Grandville Division. We were here earlier this morning, and the numbers didn't look so well. Um, we just saw a few JLP supporters out in there. Just very small numbers, and the same for the PNP. Uh, but we, we came back to this division because it's expected that uh, the candidate, the PNP candidate, Michael Strobe, he will be marking his ballot school. So we're kind of watching to see what will happen uh, there. Granville is, of course, one of the PNP strongholds, um, but the JP supporters that we spoke to this morning, they're saying that it is time for Mr. Truth to go. So we are, you know, surveying the ground to see what other persons have to say in response to that. Earlier, I was also at the Mount Salem Primary School in that division. Um, the PNP has managed to hold on to that for the last three parish council elections. The PNP candidate, Kerry Thomas, he has already voted. We haven't gotten any words from uh, the JLP candidate for that division, Rena Ford. We also saw a lot of police presence in Mount Salem, so the police have been keeping a tight wrap on that area, and they say that Supporters have been, part of supporters on both sides have been civil, they've been jubilant, no tensions or violent disruption, or violent disruptions so far. I've also been told that the JLP candidate for the Montego Bay South Division, Richard Vernon, he has already voted. My understanding is that the numbers again for both sides of the political divide has been quite slow. So we're hoping or we're expecting to see those numbers go up as the day progresses. Uh, what? Something that's important to note is that most of the voters that we've been seeing across the divisions are mostly elderly persons and middle-aged persons. We've barely seen any of the uh, younger voters. So it's definitely a high-stakes game for both the Jamaica Labour Party and the People's National Party here in St. James. The JLP has 13 of the 17 divisions. The PNP only has four. 
and they are looking to regain the division as they did in 2012. So we'll continue to survey the area to see what's happening on the ground to kind of get some understanding of how the day proceedings continue. All right, Nakinski Robinson there in St. James. Nakinski, if you're still hearing me, uh, just give us an idea of the flow of voters that you've seen so far. The polls opened at 7. It's, it's now uh, after 10. Has it been a constant flow or have there been laps or breaks in the flow of voters going in? Well, it has been slow. Um, as I said, I was in the month, I was in the Grand, Grand Division early and back here now. And the numbers still look a bit smaller. I can tell you that only for the month sale in Division, the numbers did look um, much more than what I've seen in the other divisions. But as I said, we're hoping to see by maybe midday going into the afternoon that the numbers will go up. All right, good. Thank you very much. Nakinski Robinson there in St. James. Now, as you said, and I think we have gotten that fee across most of the, the divisions, the parishes, that the votes are coming in, but they are Slow. not to any great extent yeah, yeah, yeah. an improvement over the last one. Mm -hmm. uh, from your experience, uh, Mr. Hines, it, uh, on the ground in uh, politics, how has the voting pattern been uh, th through an election day, morning, midday, and into the closing hours? Mm -hmm. Where do you see the no normal highest peak of voters mm -hmm. flowing in? Anywhere between three to five. Uh, persons don't yeah, vote per, in the later yeah, afternoon. Because, you know, persons are going to leave work at a particular time and so on. <laughs> um, so I, I'm thinking that between 3 to 5, although people always encourage voters to go out early and vote so that we can have the rest of the day, but I suspect that um, when they go out between 3 and 5, they then expect to have some kind of entertainment afterwards of the person that have won the elections and so therefore they would normally go out at that point in time and to, um, to go and vote. I think mm. the, many businesses are, and I think maybe government offices too, they are structuring mm. their work day in such a way that their workers, their employees come in mm -hmm. and give them a solid four or five hours and then they go, and then they, they go off yeah. for the rest of the day okay. because they are entitled to three, three hours, hours to of, vote yeah. plus, plus the lunch time. Hour. Right. So it, it hardly makes sense to have it staggered. Yeah, mm -hmm. uh, yeah I, I have heard a number of persons saying yeah. they plan to leave work at 2. Is it that the persons that, that companies have decided that they're going to do that close early to yeah. allow well, voters well, to yeah, vote? Most, or most, most, most do. Uh, and in yeah, some and give them the time. So mm -hmm. you know, you know, most do even like to open on a, um, an election day. Election day. Uh -huh. Well, in Spanish town and St. Catherine in particular. Well, I, I because have, I've closed my office totally today and to give my staff the time I have to do what they have to do. Yeah. Well, well you, are, you have your political um, alignment <laughs> there for that. <laughs> but in general, in general, yeah, in general it's, 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 it's makes sense. I'm wondering yeah. if it's actually structured. Um, if it's it, actually structured. It, it has that become way. the norm for, for people to understand. What, what happens there and, and people usually uh, during those times business is not as buoyant as it normally is so they just usually take the time out and okay, good uh, before you go on uh, as i said earlier we had invited uh, mr noel r scott the former local government minister to be with us he was out of town and couldn't make it here in person but we do have him live on zoom uh, mr r scott thanks for joining us through this medium Yes, good morning. Thanks for technology. We can operate <laughs> from anywhere. <laughs> all right, right. So far, uh, how has it been? First of all, where you voted in, in uh, Clarendon? Tell us what has been happening there and your assessment yes. of everything thus far. Well, I've already voted, as you can see here. And um, it's been a bit slow. Um, I've checked a few polling stations. Um, it's slow, but steady. But I haven't seen any numbers matched at any, any, any station of, that I've been to so far. But um, I would say it's pretty sweet within the target range of in maybe 38 to 40 percent. That is what I have seen so far. And um, I don't know if it'll pick up later in the day. We had some rains last night. Um, so it could have been a, damp, a damper there. But um, we, know, we get a better fix. Maybe early afternoon. All right. We, if uh, earlier, uh, when, before you joined us here on Zoom, we were speaking, of course, with uh, Mr. Hines. He's a former mayor of Portmore, as you well know. But we were looking at okay. voter turnout of previous uh, elections, local government elections, which is normally low, save uh, for 1986, as Earl pointed out to us. Um, we are anticipating, or posters have anticipated, a higher voter turnout this time around. What do you think of that, and what do you think of the low voter turnout traditionally for local government elections? Well, you know, the low 
traditionally we have not really given local government uh, the kind of support it needed. In fact, remember, when we got to office in 2012, uh, local government was uh, already a department in the office of the Prime Minister, drawn down by uh, Bruce Golden administration in 2007. So we had actually to reconstruct and, and re-energize local government. And so we had difficult economic situation, short time. And um, so by 2016, four years out, uh, we are just done now the, the three strategic laws in uh, put local government in the constitution so that it couldn't be abolished again. And it really gave some strong support to local government. The next phase would have been to ensure that reforms would take place. And um, we had in the that bill, that, that act, a uh, four-year review period. So every four years, local government should have been reviewed. And if you looked at it, if the bill carefully, we had empowered civil society significantly, PDCs, CDCs, um, the Social Development Commission was supposed to be the registrar of these um, uh, entities. And um, we even gave a section uh, for business sector, business improvement districts to be legally, um, become a legal entity where they could get trusted of business people who would upgrade their centers or their years of, 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 of operation to facilitate better ambience and to drive businesses in those areas. In fact, we had actually started in Mandan. We had upgraded Cecil Charlton Park. We had built some kiosks for young business entrepreneurs. And the next phase now would have been to get the established businesses in a wider area to upgrade the Mandan business district. So things would have been certainly different if we were able to activate the councillors in the way we had anticipated, based on all the research and the work we'd done. That, that, that had been done from all the way back from Trevor Monroe was the chairman. In fact, from Rex, to Scree Bertram, all of those works, we took them, we refashioned them, and therefore are now back. But you I, I, I hear you talking about several plans that you really had, uh, but what I'm looking at, do these actually connect with the electorate? Are persons interested in does this affect, we believe it affects them or it's important to them, but it comes back every four or five years or however long, eight years as the, is the longest I think we've waited, where persons are not really interested. They want road, they want water. That's where it stops. You haven't delivered the basic stuff. And so they're not interested in the local government election. How do you see, what, what do you think would have been done to actually change the, the turnout on the ground on election day had it been four years for the election? No, no. If we had, if we had a, Engage it, civil society and the communities. Right? You have seen a difference. But the Andrew, well, Desmond Mackenzie led local government didn't really focus on those particular things. They tried to, um, you know, spin the thing as if said, if you notice this, they focus on eh, solid ways. They spoke about the trucks coming in, albeit that we had 50 trucks which came in and they received them. Um, and, the, you know, they spoke about some other things. The social component where you engage the people, you know, is really where I think the thing fell down. And there was really no, no serious attempt made. And going forward, any council who does not engage his, his, um, his constituent is going to find himself in the same position now where people are disengaged. I mean, you take a thing like water, for example. Water primary is National Water Commission's business. But it is, you know, the local authorities, you know, certainly they could, they're advocates and they need to advocate for their constituents. But the responsibility, apart from the few minor water supply system, water is primarily the responsibility of the National Water Commission. Okay. All right. I'm going to hold it, right? I'm going to hold that. Hold that hold thought for me, uh, Mr. R. Scott. Of course, we're almost time to for us to wrap up here on our, sh our first show, our, sec our first show for the day, election day. But as we said earlier, our reporters are right across the country. Uh, we have Raquel Porter, she's in St. Catherine, and she now gives us an update of what's happening there. Raquel, what can you tell us? Thanks, Herman. So it's a sunny day here in the Old Arbor South at Old Arbor Bay Primary School, clad in orange and green, the young elderly 
and persons with disabilities have been trickling in. But earlier, some supporters waited in queue to enter the classrooms minutes before 7 o'clock. About 7.15, the People's National Party candidate vying for the Old Arbor South Division, Dr. Kurt Wall, entered the polling station. Dr. Wall, you have until 5 o'clock to vote. Why did you come, come out this early? of activities right i'll be visiting the other polling stations to ensure that everything is going on smoothly because when i came here this morning i saw one infraction already i saw where the, the labor party supporters were playing their campaign songs right outside of the you know the polling station and i don't think that's correct so those are the things that why i got the voting out my vote out early so i could go and check on the other polling stations to ensure that everything was running smoothly Dr. Wall, you contested the 2020 general election and lost the Member of Parliament, Everald Warmington. Why are you now a councillor? Well, after the 2020 elections and I lost, the, the divisional seat became vacant because the gentleman who was filling the seat, he, he, stepped, he stood down, basically. And uh, this seat, this divisional seat is one of the ones that swings, right? And... I couldn't allow it to just fall by the wayside because if we went into a local government election and lost all four seats again, then it would make no sense going on further with the, with the political activity. So, you know, I said that I would set an example to my other councillor candidates and show them that, you know, I am ready to run elections, so they should be ready at all times. Speaking there with People's National Party candidate for Old Harbour South Division, Dr. Wall is up against the Jamaica Labour Party candidate, Lloyd Grant. I spoke with Mr. Grant, who has voted earlier, and I have to tell you that Mr. Grant broke his leg last night, but he said he will win on one, one foot. So I'll have further updates in subsequent headlines. Back to you. All right. Thank you very much. Raquel Porter there in St. Catherine. Now, uh, our reporters are on the go and right across the, uh, the, the country. Uh, I believe we have some footage of uh, Mr. Holness and his wife, Prime Minister Andrew Holness. They just arrived to vote. Uh, that's in Mona. Of course, several are reported, as you can see in these images. Reporters, videographers are walking with them as they go about marking their ballots for this local government election. And he's voting in a contest within a contest here. Uh, Herman, this is this is where Venetia Phillips, right. who was with the PNP and has defected to the JLP, this is where she um, she's running. She's for running, and I think the PNP has put extraordinary effort into defeating her. Obviously, Prime Minister Holness will be doing his best to buttress her as well. All right, and we have several of these across uh, the the country in terms of candidates. Uh, going to the other side. We're pretty much at the end of our show for this hour. Uh, Earl, your final comments on today's happening so far? Well, thus far, everybody has been saying that the turnout has not been extraordinary. Uh, but as we also said, it is likely to pick up after lunch. Let's see what happens at the end of the day. I still believe that the turnout will be high, higher than what you saw in 2016. All right, uh, Mr. Hines? Well, I'm expecting at least a 50% turnout in this election. And I'm also expecting the Jamaica Labour Party to retain the parish councils and to do even better. I know my friend Noel is down in Clarendon there. I hope he buys me some fish later on. <laughs> Mr. Robert, your final comments? Well, whoever wins, I hope that the whole community and Spanish run St. Catherine and the entire Jamaica will benefit from whoever wins and put a new spin and a new effort to move into a, a more dynamic way of dealing with local government. Okay, and Mr. Arscott, you joined us late. You have the final say. Yes. Uh, you know, one of the factors that you guys have not looked at is the Papin division. You know, we recently named um, Patricia Duncan Sutherland as a candidate for that constituency. And I believe she's going to make the difference to the outcome of that, of that division today. You watch my, what Mark Moore works. <laughs> All right. Certainly, um, I was happy the, the campaign has been relatively peaceful. We have seen many times that both parties have passed in both cases and we have not had any, any major incidents. So, good campaign. 
I think we need to put local government back at the forefront. They can okay. do a lot. To all right, we're, we're out of time, Mr. Mr. R. Scott. Thank you very much. And thank you very much for those of you at home, at work, wherever you are watching. Of course, this is just a second show. Uh, remember, we have our newscast at 12 o'clock. We'll be looking right across the country once again at everything that has been done. Thank you for watching. Please stay with us. I'm Herman Green. See you then.